And I'm at the uh, Animal Genomics and Improvement Lab in Bellsville. That's typically a, a dairy cattle lab. And um, so this is my first beef meeting. And actually, uh, before joining the uh, before joining ARS at AJL, I was actually in plant biology. So um, this is definitely a, a new experience for me. And it's actually been great to be here and listen to the different talks. Um, so I'm going to tell you today about uh, um, developing our pan genome to kind of replace the current reference genome for genomic studies. Um, so I'll tell you about the the pan genome consortium that uh, I've launched with Tim Smith and Derek Bickhart, um, both at ARS, one in um, uh, U.S. Mark in Nebraska, and the other at Terry Farge, Madison, Wisconsin. Um, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we assemble our genomes. And then finally, talk about pan genomes. Uh, so the uh, the bovine uh, pan genome consortium is an international research collaboration uh, that's focused on sequencing and assembling uh, the breadth of global diversity in cattle. Um, so our our efforts are trying to um, capture all that diversity. We are going to do this through assemblies ourselves also by providing sequencing to other groups who are interested and don't have the resources, as well as others who may have resources to do sequencing, uh, but don't have bioinformatic support. Um, we're, you know, willing to, you know, work the whole gambit of different types of collaborations to try and get this done. Um, our goal is to generate high quality, couple type resolved assemblies um, for all of the cattle, major cattle breeds, um, as well as sort of heritage local breeds um, who may not, whose diversity may not be represented in the major cattle breeds, um, and also wild relatives of cattle, um, because there have been introgressions in the past, and it would be good to capture some of that diversity as well. Um, we hope to identify breed and species-specific genetic loci, um, and the, the ultimate goal of the, the project is to enhance genom genomic tools uh, and resources for the community. Um, so, uh, what is a pan genome, and why do we need it? Uh, well. Uh, the, the cattle pan genome is a union of all genetic diversity found within both Bos indicus and Bos taurus cattle. Um, and so the current reference genome is uh, based on a it's a single it's a single individual it's a linear representation of a diploid individual. And so this is the uh, the cow the Hereford cow dominant who is currently the reference. Um, but even if dominates Genome assembly were perfect, uh, which it's very much not. Um, a single individual is insufficient to capture the entire genetic diversity uh, found in cattle worldwide. Um, so these images are just a few, a fraction of the hundreds of breeds that are recognized globally. Um, these breeds have been developed under diverse conditions and for multiple different purposes. Um, and from at least two different independent domestication events, most likely more. Um, and additionally, uh, there's been a long history of introgression, both between Bos indicus and Bos taurus in parts of the world, uh, as well as uh, occasional introgression of wild species, uh, such as Bantang in Southeast Asia. Um, so this leads to, like, a, to a, a very complicated genomic landscape, and certainly much more complicated than can be represented by a single individual. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background about how we assemble our genomes um, so, and, and, and why it's important to have a pan genome. Um, so, so one of the complications for cattle genomes and mammalian genomes in general is that they're highly repetitive. And um, when you're trying to piece together a genome from individual reads, uh, repetitive DNA can cause errors when the read length is shorter than the repeat unit itself. And so you can kind of think of this as a jigsaw puzzle, and the repetitive fraction of the genome is going to be like these sky pieces. Uh, you can imagine it would be very difficult to place these sky pieces accurately um, in your jigsaw puzzle. And whereas, you know, genic regions you can think of as these birds are a little bit easier to piece together, but you may not be able to put them in the proper context um, in relation to each other if you don't have better information. Um, Thankfully, for the past uh, number of years now, we've had some long read sequencing technologies, which have really uh, improved our ability to assemble genomes. Um, so uh, you can think of it as having these very large puzzle pieces, which as you can see, would make assembling this puzzle a much simpler task. 
Um, some of the technologies that we are building our assemblies from uh, include, uh, they started off with the PacBio um, CLRs, which is just think of it as PacBio long reads. They're highly error prone, um, but you end up with reads between 10 and 80 kilobases long. Um, more recently, PacBio has come out with a new technology um, called HiFi, high fidelity or uh, circular consensus. And what they do is you take your um, sequence, your piece of DNA, and you actually make it a circle. And then you read around that circle multiple times, which, and then you get a consensus uh, um, sequence out of that, which improves the accuracy to about 99.9% .9 accuracy. Um, so many few errors. Um, there's also Oxford Nanopore, and um, those reads tend to be from, uh, you know, tens of KBs to hundreds of KB, and you can even get megabase length reads. Um, these are really useful for um, crossing some challenging regions in the genome, um, tandem repeats, and longer repeats, uh, where even the, the high fidelity reads would have trouble because they're just still too short. Um, and then actually even more recently, Nanopore has come out with a, a duplex technology. This essentially enables you, enables you to read both strands of the DNA molecule, so similar to uh, the HiFi where you're reading multiple times. Um, the nanopore, you actually, um, with um, recent increases in the read accuracy that you get in general from nanopore, um, combined with reading that strand twice, you actually end up with a, uh, a read accuracy that uh, is somewhat similar to PacBio HiFi, um, although um, still slightly higher error rates. Um, so one of the approaches that we've been taking to assembling our genomes is using this trio binning approach. And what that does is that allows us to sequence um, the offspring of uh, two diverse parents. And what we do is we get long reads of that offspring and we use information from the parents to separate those reads into separate bins prior to assembly. And so one of the complications with genome assembly um, that we used to have is that you'd have um, within your genome, you have inherited chromosomes from both parents, and those uh, can be very difficult to distinguish from repetitive fractures within a single genome. Um, and so to get around that, the strategy used to be to get a highly inbred individual to minimize the number of differences between those two haplotypes, which would cause issues in your genome assembly. Now we can actually take advantage of those um, differences and get a much more accurate genome assembly. Um, and uh, so we typically do um, short read sequencing of the parents, illumina sequencing. We identify unique sequences within those parents, and then we, we find those unique sequences within our long reads to separate them. Um, as the long read technologies have gotten better, we've been able to um, sequence um, less diverse process and get um, even more accurate assemblies. And so now at this point, you know, we started off, this is as a bison cross with a scimitol that we got two great haplotype resolved assemblies from. We can now get just as good of assemblies from a within breed cross um, due to the increases in uh, read accuracy. Um, so um, we also generate short read data um, to, to polish those assemblies to get a greater consensus accuracy at the end. Um, and then we use uh, this, this technology called TIE-C, which captures three-dimensional structure of DNA to give you linkage between um, uh, more distant regions in the genome to know that these, um, these contigs, these shorter fragments that you assemble, actually belong next to each other. And we can go ahead and um, scaffold up to chromosome length um, using these technologies. Um, so as um, sequencing technologies improved and assembly methods have improved, we're actually now able to, um, and some of you may have heard that the human genome was recently completed. Um, so they, they, they published this method with the human genome, the um, group at the National Human Genome Research Institute. Um, and we're now working with them to generate um, complete genomes with cat, within cattle. Um, so we're actually working on this uh, with a, cross between a Wagyu and a Charlet. We have um, used the HiFi data. Remember I mentioned these really um, very accurate um, medium length reads. And then we can take ultra long nanopore data. And so what we do is we target reads that are longer than 100 KB. 
and we try and get about 30x coverage of the genome in these 100 kb or larger reads. Um, so we have to do quite a bit of sequencing there to get that type of depth of coverage. Um, and then we use Illumina data from the parent to save it. And so, but the, the difference between this method is that we actually, from the HiFi data, we get apple type resolved contigs, and then we take that ultra long nanopore data and we align it to those contigs. And what you get out at the end are, uh, and then after we've resolved issues um, with the nanopore data to get even longer contigs, we use the Illumina data from the parents to just define which apple type these different segments come from. Um, and although this might look complicated, um, this is a, an assembly graph of the two haplotypes. We have the maternal in pink and the paternal in purple, purple is blue. Um, and what you see is that we actually have um, fully resolved chromosomes. And when these two lines come together, that actually is a region of homozygosity within the genomes. And they're typically very short compared to these tails, which you can see um, colored in these bubbles, which are colored. Um, regions where you see kind of a tangled mess are actually not as complicated as they look. These are some small repetitive regions in the genomes, like the ribosomal um, DNA arrays. Uh, they tend to be found at the ends of chromosomes. They kind of make a, a tangled mess, but you can actually separate these out fairly easily. Um, and so uh, one thing I'll point out is that we're able to fully assemble the X chromosome. Um, and then we have a Y chromosome down here as well. Um, so the, I believe the current cattle Y reference from the Angus is something like 20 megabases long. Um, and the Arcondic here for the, the, y, the, the Wagyu Y chromosome, I think is 46 megabases. Um, so much more complete information. Um, so I, I mentioned we have you know, the ability to create these great reference genomes. Um, we have the Hereford reference. We have um, now actually uh, two high quality references for Boss Indicus, um, many more for Boss Taurus. Um, we're going to have these um, near, pretty much complete genomes for Wagyu and Charlet. So um, well, why don't we just stop there and you know, call it good? Um, so the problem is uh, that, um, well, there's a couple of problems. One is that uh, you don't want everybody to be running their analyses on different genomes. That's going to cause a lot of confusion in the, in the community. And uh, there have been other communities which have run into this issue um, where everyone's doing their analyses on different genomes. It's kind of like what happened when um, the UMD reference first came out and people were using the Baylor reference, people were using um, the UMD, and it can cause a lot of confusion. Uh, so we'd like to have one reference genome. The other thing is that no linear reference genome is going to do a very good job of capturing structural variation. And so one of the benefits of a pan genome is that you can actually uh, catalog structural variation. And so here is what a pan genome looks like. Um, the, you can think of this thick gray bar as the linear reference. And if uh, there was no difference between the different um, in within a region, you would just see a linear reference the way you do with the current assembly. Uh, but whenever there's a structural variation, in this case here, you see different numbers of a 30 base pair repeat, you see these little bubbles that pop out. And what you can do is you can align data, either long reads or short reads to this pan genome, and it will put the reads in the proper places. So instead of having confusion around something like this, you'd actually see a, you know, a paired read with a line here and a paired read with a line there. And in another breed, you have a read aligned here and one read aligned here. And so you can walk through this graph taking different routes depending on what you actually have in your genome. Um, so what we see here, I said, there's you know, some 30 base pair repeats. Um, here is actually uh, where you have a, um, a deletion about 17 KB that occurs across multiple lineages. Um, or I'm sorry, across this one lineage, most have this 17 KB piece. Uh, and then here's another uh, kind of tandem um, little duplication that can occur in certain lineages. Um, so why do we care about structural variance? Um, so here's a graph from um, a study in humans where they actually assembled 64 uh, haplotypes and they looked at the increase in structural variance as you uh, add individuals to the, uh, to the data. 
And you can see that any one individual only has a small fraction of the structural variants that are found within the population. Um, and uh, another thing to point out is that this was done in humans, um, which are known to have a smaller uh, genetic base, um, much less diversity within humans than within cattle. Um, and you see that uh, you know the human population starts to sort of taper off in the number of new structural variants that are being added for each individual until you move to uh, African individuals where you start to see a, a greater increase again, and that rate of increase um, goes up. And so you kind of think of, as we look across Boss Taurus um, breeds, we might see a tapering off, and then you'll get the Boss Indicus, um, or you'll get to uh, African taurine. And so there's um, a lot of structural variation that we would miss if we didn't have a pan genome. Um, so people have started to look at and generate pan genomes within cattle. As I mentioned, we have a number of high quality reference genomes where people could do this. Um, these are different um, members of the bovine pan genome consortium who have come out with papers in recent years. Um, so uh, one thing I'll point out is that they've all found that the Hereford reference is missing um, some sizable amounts of DNA um, from these other breeds. And you may think, you know, you have a almost three gigabase genome, well, 40 megabases isn't that large, but that's actually about almost a chromosome's worth of DNA um, for some of those smaller chromosomes in cattle. Um, so um, the other thing to note is that as your distance, your genetic distance from the Hereford reference increases, you see more unique sequence found in each of those breeds. And so here we have on the right is the amount of sequence that is um, missing from the reference, the Hereford reference in each of these breeds. And then on, in parentheses is the amount of sequence that is unique to each of those breeds. And you can, and as you might imagine, the Boss Indicus has more unique sequence compared to the Boss, other Boss Taurus breeds. So uh, we also um, wanted to ask a couple of questions about pan genomes and, and more than just creating a pan genome, we were interested in, in how a pan genome um, how the input to a pan genome um, impacts the quality of the pan genome. And so uh, as I was putting this talk together, I realized that we have a, a terribly confusing title to our manuscript. We're sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, what we really wanted to find out was what happens if you created pan genome from different sequencing technologies or different coverage levels or if you were to mix them, right? Because within the cattle community, we don't have the ability to have a single project sequence all of the different breeds with one set of parameters for um, the data quality and for the data generation. You know, this is gonna, we're gonna be able, we wanna be able to take everything that we possibly can um, and so that we have as most, you know, as comprehensive of a collection of breeds as possible. Um, and, but we wanted to know if that was gonna impact the, the downstream quality of our pan genome. And so we, we decided to look at this. Uh, and what we found, thankfully, uh, was that it did not really hurt the pan genome to have different input sources. So we found that 92% of structural variation, variants were common between the HiFi and nanopore um, assemblies. Um, and that, um, so there's about 3.6% unique um, structural variants, um, which added up to about just less than two megabases within the HiFi pan genome graph. Uh, this actually ends up being uh, mostly centromeric sleep sequence. Uh, the HiFi data, the high accuracy of the, that data um, actually allows you to assemble through centromeric repeats slightly better than the high error, higher error nanopore data does. Um, and, but there were some you know, unique structural variants within the nanopore data that tended to be, um, so 4.3% of the structural variants were unique, but it was actually a, much smaller variants that we were identifying with nanopore. Um, and there are almost no variants that were unique to either just the full coverage data sets or the reduced coverage data sets. So even though the reduced coverage assemblies are um, slightly lower quality, they're still able to identify most of the structural variants within the pan genome, which um, gives us hope that we don't have to generate quite as deep a data across all the breeds that we want to target. Um, so the other thing that we were able to do was that we were able to um, identify uh, trade-associated structural variants within our pan genome. And so uh, we 
we took a look at our structure variants and just did a simple analysis of how many of them overlapped with annotated genes, coding sequences within the genome. And then we just picked out a couple of them to take a closer look at. Um, so one is this uh, uh, QRIC2 gene, uh, which is involved in sperm motility. Um, and what you see is we found it was, um, it was I, I sort of showed this before in my little mock-up of a pan genome, but it is um, differing numbers of this 30 base pair repeat uh, that can occur. And, and it might be difficult to, to see what's going on here, um, but that's actually kind of the point. So this is actually a short read alignment of these different assemblies, uh, reads from these different assemblies uh, to the reference. And what you can see is that it's very difficult to identify what the structural variant is based upon short read data alone. Um, but when we have our pan genome, it's actually very easy and very clear to align that read uh, and to identify which collection of repeat units will be found in that individual. Um, so we also looked at this, um, this, uh, this, this PRDM9 gene, it's involved in recombination, uh, and it's uh, an 84 base pair repeat. You either have uh, five copies, six copies, or seven copies of it in your genome, um, and that corresponds to this uh, line straight through here would be five, you add one here and come back, it'll be six, or you come through both to get your seven. Uh, and that's actually a, a zinc finger motif in this gene, uh, and which has variable numbers. Um, and what we actually see is that, um, uh, as I mentioned, we can, the, this, this pan genome was built with ha two different haplotypes of an original brown bay animal. And, and what we can see is that the pan genome is actually able to differentiate between those two haplotypes and find that structural variant within the breed. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, our goal is to try and capture as much genetic diversity across cattle as we can. Uh, what you see here is a modification of, um, of Jared Decker's um, phylogeny of cattle. Uh, but on the left, we have Boss Indicus breeds and African Taurine breeds. And then on the right are the Boss uh, Taurus, the rest of the Boss Taurus breeds. Uh, I don't expect you to be able to read any of those breed names. Um, but uh, I do want you to note that we are, if we have actually gotten um, fairly decent, even coverage across um, the diversity of cattle. Now, this I think is a little limited in the diversity of both indicus in this particular analysis. Um, but we also have partners in China who are working on um, assembling a lot of the both indicus in China. Um, so, so that will partially be taken care of. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank um, my, my fellow pain genome coordinators, Derek Bickhart and Tim Smith. Uh, we have a steering committee that helps us uh, plan things out. And then um, here are some of our sample providers and our collaborators.